it's a great night to be in town, right? We're here, we're back in person this year for the film festival. It's gonna be a good night, I'm excited. Well, uh, I just wanted to let you know who I am, in case you didn't know, which you probably didn't. It's not loud enough. It's not loud enough. I got though. There we go. <laughs> we have someone to fix that. Um, so I'm Crystal Haynes, I'm an Arlington resident. I live just around the corner off of River Street. I'm a journalist uh, and TV anchor on Boston 25 News, and I've been there for about 11 years this summer. And it is certainly my absolute pleasure to be with you all this evening. You know, on behalf of the festival organizers, I do want to welcome you all again to the 12th annual opening night of the Arlington International Film Festival. We want to welcome our filmmakers, our special guests, and of course you, our audience members. So, uh, you know, as a custom, the festival year began with the annual poster competition in partnership with the Mass College of Art and Design's illustration department. And this year's winning design was created by Ariana Stone. Then the film submissions were reviewed 12 years ago. Did you all know that there was less than 50? And this year, can you guess what the number was of submissions? Oh. Well, a little bit higher. In uh, 2023, for this year, it was 1,024 submissions from all around the world. Can you believe that? Incredible. Just incredible. And you know it takes a lot of qualified people with expertise in design and marketing to choose a poster that represents AIFF and, and qualified people with expertise in film to review all of those submissions. Again, over 1,000 this year. And of course, curate a program that meets the criteria of the festival's mission, which is to foster appreciation for different cultures by exploring the lives of people around the globe through independent film. So our sincere thanks and recognition go out to the poster judges and the film jury members, of course, and that brings uh, those folks all together. They absolutely bring this festival to fruition. You know, the partnerships and relationship building continue as AIFF puts Arlington on the map. I don't have enough gifts, so I started walking and then got close on a little bit. <laughs> as recent as 2021, partnerships were forged with two European film festivals, Unified Filmmakers, based in Munich, Germany, and International Independent Film Festival, uh, Elch, in uh, El Cantian, uh, mm, Alberto, how you pronounce that? Eche. Eche. There you go, right there. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell I'm from, I'm from here, so. <laughs> AIFF takes great pride in its collaborations and its commitment to building as well as maintaining vibrant partnerships with local businesses and organizations. This year we have several new sponsors that have joined us along with numerous sponsors that continue with their support and of course we thank them, big thank you to them. Our sincere thanks go out to each and every one of you, of course, for investing in this festival and keeping the art of indie film alive and most importantly, accessible. I'd like to offer a special recognition to this year's opening night sponsor, Network for Social Justice. Please welcome to the stage, Executive Director, uh, Leora Norwich. Two seconds. Yep. Go ahead. Try that. Try it again. There. there we go. Hi, everyone, and thank you to the Arlington International Film Festival for inviting me here this evening. My name is Leora Norwich, and I am the executive director of the Network for Social Justice, previously the Winchester Multicultural Network, and it's absolutely our pleasure to be part of the festival this year. We are a small nonprofit with a 30 year history based in a town very far away, or approximately two miles away. We're in Winchester, and I saw a number of folks who have come out to some of our programs in the last couple months and years, so it was great to be here tonight. Our mission is to foster a movement for equity and inclusion by advancing structural changes in our town and in our helping our neighbors farther afield. 
to build this movement and tonight we're going to be talking about some movements and in a way we see ourselves very much like the other human rights and he racism organizations and commissions all over massachusetts we work through community education like programs around anti racism allyship community facilitation and we build community engagement initiatives we celebrate diversity may commemorate historic moments and we use those as pauses to think about change still needed and we look to drive advocacy, including targeted campaigns in support of indigenous peoples and housing, to name a few. It is such a pleasure to be with you all tonight and to be able to partner with the film festival to engage in a conversation around this topic with tonight's panel. The festival is such a resource, as I know all of you know, in both the Arlington community and beyond it, and the partnership shows me the myriad of ways in which we can join together to collaborate for social change. So thank you again, and I'm really excited for tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. And of course, now it is my esteemed privilege to welcome our fearless leader leaders up to the stage, Alberta Guzman, founder and organizer, and April Rank, the executive director of the Arlington International Film Festival. Thank you, Crystal. And thank you to Network for Social Justice for sponsoring this evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here with us. And first, I want to say thank you to the, to the Capitol Theater, Jamie, Jay, and the crew for hosting one more year of the Arlington International Film Festival. And welcome to all of you for, be, for supporting the festival. I hope that you enjoy this great lineup of films for this year. It's so great. <laughs> it's so great to see faces and not be on Zoom. Uh, it's, it's so wonderful. And uh, Alberto was right. I think that the programming this year is amazing and it's something for everyone. And as Crystal said, uh, AIFF has built a strong network of relationships with both businesses and organizations here and abroad. And we have been fortunate to have exemplary volunteers by our side, uh, Linda Yi. Uh, we're here, I want Linda to join us on stage, please. Um, we're here this evening um, and, and wanting to honor one of our volunteers that have been with us since 2011. She's assisted us in marketing, event development, and grant writing for special projects. And in 2012, we opened the festival with Vivian Ducat's film, all, uh, documentary film, All Me, The Life and Times of Winfred Rembert, chronicling a young black man caught up in the civil rights movement in the South, his time in prison, and his amazing technique of tooling these stories on leather. So Linda was inspired uh, by Winfred and his history. And on behalf of AIFF, she spent the next two years heading up a team that brought Mr. Rembert to the Arlington High School for a highly successful integrated art, history, and English residency in 2014. A residency that inspired not only the students, but left a lasting impact on the community. Uh, and I will say, uh, Mr. Winfred, uh, Rembert passed away uh, a year and a half ago, so I think uh, Linda was very aware that we had a short time frame to have a piece of living history uh, with our students and, and our community, so she acted on it. Um, Linda is an educator who works with students that have learning disabilities, and she is passionate about educating her students about diversity. In her words, ultimately helping to prepare them to navigate and integrate successfully into a global society. I think sometimes we forget that that has to be taught. It's not always uh, just something that um, is, is uh, automatically assumed that we know. Alberto and I honor Linda Yee for her dedication to the Arlington International Film Festival, its mission of promoting appreciation for different cultures and more broadly, her contributions to the greater Boston community. Thank you, Linda for your vision, your enthusiasm, and the time that you have invested in AIFF. We thank you. This year we 
open with a program that honors the strength of women. Uh, we begin with an award-winning short from India, The Scapegoat, by Tagathara Ghosh, acknowledging that there are some difficult and graphic scenes in this short. Our jury felt that the message of this film was important and should be included in our programming. It not only delivers a meaningful message about the strength of women, but how religion continues to be used to artificially divide us. Then we will move right into our best documentary feature for festival year 2022, How Long Must We Wait by filmmaker Jacqueline O'Loughlin, who is with us tonight. Uh, we hope you enjoy the films and we invite you to please stay seated after the screening for a panel discussion that will follow. Enjoy. So Jacqueline, uh, I want to say congratulations, right? Uh, congratulations. Um, was this your first, was this your first film? It's my first feature length film. Can you guys hear me? Um, I'm I thought you did. Turn it up. Yeah? Talk loud. Turn it up. Thank you. Um, maybe it's working. Uh, it's my first feature length film. But I have done shorter pieces. Louder. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> working on it. <laughs> the more she talks, the more I can adjust. Okay, uh, in you know the outfit is stunning and very uh, and very and very appropriate for right now. <laughs> okay, um, and so you know what inspired you to choose women's suffrage as a topic for your first feature length film? Well, yeah. Uh, so hopefully you can hear me now. I so I've done a lot of shorter films. This was my first feature length film, and one of the shorter films I did was about something about encaustic painting. And I, so I'm from the Washington DC area and we really like these short film competitions. I don't know why it's just a thing in that area. So I did a two day film competition. So I had two days to make a documentary film. So I did it on encaustic painting. And one of the women featured is obviously an encaustic painter, but she's done this whole series of suffragists, whole series on suffragists. So um, I won the competition. Um, and so the, my friend that I made the, the film with, we were like, what else can we do? We're obviously good at this. <laughs> and uh, so the woman who is this amazing painter, who does the suffragist paintings, that's actually his wife. And she has a studio space in a place called the Workhouse Art Center, which is outside Washington, D.C. That place was where the prison was. The prison, the former prison is now a community center, um, artists can rent studio spaces, so she had a studio space there. And so just like piecing everything together, we were like, obviously we have to do it about these women, um, you know, who were sent to jail there. Um, mm -hmm. So that's really what inspired it. And I have to ask, as a personal, you know, acolyte of Ida B. Wells, it seemed oh, yeah. like the black woman suffrage movement was kind of a little bit absent from the film. Was that like on purpose? And I remember specifically one of the docu the, this, the one yeah. of the um, historians you spoke to was like, yeah, that was a pretty bad situation. So then Absolutely. this. Oh, it was more than and the, one. Yeah, and so I'm thoughtful about if that was a cut for time or the way that historians in this space sort of think about that conflict between women of color and the, the suffragettes uh, like Alice Paul in them? Sure, yeah, that's a very, that's a complicated question. That's a very nuanced answer I will give. But I, I really struggled with what to put in there in terms of the black suffrage movement. And all of the women I interviewed, they, they mostly talked about um, the racism aspect that happened in the prison. Like when the white suffragists were, had to sleep in the same room as the black prisoners. And I felt that was very important to keep it because racism was part of the movement. So to me, that was important. But when we interviewed people, I will say we didn't ask them a lot of questions about that. Mm -hmm. And partly because I was learning about the movement <laughs> as I'm interviewing these historians. And knowing what I know now, I would have asked more questions. Um, but they, they didn't touch on the fact that you know, Howard University students wanted to join the march in 1913. Ida B. Wells asked to join, and they wanted her to march in the back. At first, they stalled and didn't give them an answer. Alice Paul dragged her feet, 
and she was very political. She didn't want uh, to lose any votes in the South. And obviously, people in the South are very racist. And Ida B. Wells was like, I don't care what you say. I'm just joining where I, sh where I should be. And you know, in the end, it wound up being OK in terms of black uh, suffragists joining the march. But racism is a huge part, if not huge stain, on Alice Paul's reputation, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. That sort of dovetails into our question for, for Patty um, in talking about the formation of the League of Women Voters. And I know that in our sort of pre-conversation to this panel, we spoke a lot about that, that tension in, in the creation of, of, of subsequent groups out of uh, Alice Paul's National Women's Party. Yeah, I, I, think what, um, I think what Jacqueline's saying is right. Um, I think there was a calculated you know, strategy um, that was based in racism, and they wanted, you know, Sherry Cap Carrie Chapman Catt and Alice Paul and others, they, want, they wanted to appeal to the Southern legislators, um, and so they had to downplay and relegate to the back the, the, the black women that were involved in the suffrage movement. So um, they were certainly, certainly racism played a big part in that. Um, and you know, as, as I think that the way you talked about it, it is a stain on, oh, yeah. on the, not only the movement, but as uh, we talked about in our pre-conversation, um, the League of Women Voters is the organization that grew out of the suffrage movement. So the, the League was founded, the National League was founded in February of 1920, and then the, the State League of Massachusetts was founded in May, so several months before the ratification. Um, and you know, to this day, I think, we are the organization is you know has suffered um, from the from from the racism that was embedded at the beginning of the movement, you know to, to the point where um, you know the even today so the league in Massachusetts has grown up mainly in wealthier white suburbs. We have 46 local chapters um, all around the state, but not not completely, but by and large, it's it's wealthier white women. Um, who, who got involved, you know, even from the beginning. So, um, you know, we currently have a policy of diversity, equity, and inclusion where we are trying to um, be more active in gateway cities and other places where uh, populations of color live um, and work so that we can, you know, sort of broaden our membership recruitment efforts and build our leadership pipeline to reflect um, what Massachusetts is today, to, to reflect the diversity of, of this commonwealth. Mm. And Celia, you know, you organized the Massachusetts Women of Color Coalition. How, I know, what were your reflections in seeing the documentary and, and where you sit in terms of organizing women? Sure. So first of all, I want to congratulate oh, you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's, yeah. I think we can take a page out of the book of those women back there. I mean, I was absolutely moved by the fact that they didn't have text, they didn't have, you know, Instagram, they didn't have all the social media we have now and we're able to organize. So I definitely think that's something uh, we can reflect in and really um, utilize in our sort of toolbox. But for me, and one of the things that our organization, uh, one of our core values is about truth telling. And sometimes that's not easy, right? Um, but in order for us to move forward, we really need to understand our history and the reality is not all of our history are taught in school, so we end up growing up really learning about our history. And so for me, um, you know, I'm always going to be advocating for women of color because our inequities are so great, which is why um, we formed as an organization, because I'm one of these people that say, don't just be a part of the problem, be a part of the solution, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so for me, I just felt there was a missed opportunity to really talk about the black um, uh, suffragists and their um, contribution, um, and that, um, and then ultimately when they were really able to vote. Mm -hmm. Because the reality is, because of the fact that, and you mentioned the South, um, with the way that uh, there was a lot of discrimination, I mean, people were getting beat up to vote, all of those things, um, you know, that um, that didn't happen right away for, for black and indigenous women to be able to vote. So I think there might be a part two there, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's so that blows it for me because every time, 
you know, what I, what I, and you know, this is not a Debbie Downer, but every time we can relearn and we can yeah. tell our real history, the better off we are so that we can do better. So that's really my approach. Absolutely, and, and it's not just Paul's generation that missed this opportunity. Like the generations before her, the the suffrage movement before that preceded Paul, you know, Harriet Tubman is on record talking about suffrage. Yeah. People who were on the Underground Railroad with Sojourner Truth, Phyllis Wheatley, all these people on record talking about suffrage. And, and Phyllis Wheatley, when you talk about that with Massachusetts roots as yeah. well, there. That's the right, missed right. opportunity for someone like that. Right, and Josephine St. Pierre exactly. moving here in Massachusetts, that was huge. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, absolutely. And I mean, I think that that's a great part, too, right? So, <laughs> I, so I think, too, it, it's yeah. important that, you know, we were taught, they've been sort of relegated to a footnote, but the, I, the important thing that I learned was that they were doing their own organizing. Mm -hmm. I mean, black women were organizing among their all peers, along. you know, yeah, all yeah. along. So. Um, it, it, and it's very interesting to read about what they were doing. Yeah. So even though you have to kind of dig around to find right. it. Right, and, and as we talk about the tenacity for, of women, they didn't give up. Yeah. They right. were a big part of the Voter Right Act. So that's, you know, that's you know, the power there too, as well right. as women. Yeah. Absolutely. She, okay, perfect. My mic works, perfect, okay. <laughs> so um, Shayla, uh, talk to us a little bit about um, the, being the director of health policy and government relations for Planned Parenthood League of Massachusetts because women's rights are right there, right? The end of the film, we talked about the overturning of Roe v. Wade, and as we look toward young folks like yourself be carrying on the movement and in, in all its other um, facets and things like that, what were you, some of your takeaways through your lens um, in, the, in the documentary? Yeah, thank you so much for your hearing. Thank you so much for. Yeah. I got you. Great, awesome. Thank you so much for that question. Yeah. Um, yeah. So a little bit about my work, and I thought the film was wonderful. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it was really yeah, inspired yeah, it was by fair. everything that uh, every everything that I was seeing. Um, but a little bit about my work. I like to tell people that I read, write, and explain reproductive law in Massachusetts, <laughs> and it's very fun. And I have. Uh, I stand in a position of a lot of privilege because I do this work in Massachusetts. Mm. We have amazing reproductive justice champions at our legislator, at our local level, all across like stakeholders, all across the Commonwealth. So, you know, my job is relative to the rest of the country. I feel, I feel very privileged and honored to do this work. Um, when I was when I was watching the film, I was I was very inspired, and you know I I kept thinking back, and I'm so happy we're having this conversation. I kept thinking back to the origins of Planned Parenthood. Right, Planned Parenthood's origins are very racist, unfortunately. You know, and when thinking about um, Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, there's a lot of I, I guess battle. Right, because we want to be abortion justice champions. We want to be uh, for women's right, including the right to bodily autonomy. But then at face with this like dual truth, and so you know, I love what you said about facing the truth head on and really coming to terms with it. And so understanding, like myself as a woman of color, growing up low income, is this place for me? I remember I had that very difficult conversation with myself. And I was like, but I love this work, mm. you know? And I love how far we've come. And so I, I did my own digging and I did my own truth finding on the origins of reproductive justice and understanding that it was led by black women, indigenous women, women of color, trans women, uh, the fight for bodily autonomy. And that's what got me on board. And so I remember joining Planned Parenthood and that being upfront about this history and being like, this is where we were and this is where we're going. I related it completely back to, to the movie. Mm. Understanding that this is where we come from, facing that truth head on so we can achieve equality, that's really the takeaway that I got from, from watching the movie and reflecting back to the work. So it was a very, it was a very impactful experience for me. Yeah. yeah, and Jacqueline, I think about, because I saw the major motion film with, uh, what was it, was oh, it yeah, Hillary Swank. Hillary yeah. Swank and them. Um, and I thought this did a better job of certainly explaining I the history, actually, right? <laughs> I have 
major problems with that movie, but okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. Um, you could tell that some of the storylines were absolutely forced. But yeah, that was, they just like have a romantic interest in the film. And yeah. I'm like, that's just, that's not what happened. <laughs> yeah, there's rumors Alice Paul was a lesbian. I don't know if that's true, but like she, in the movie, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now that you did your I own fact that. finding. But, right. but I think about like I think about when you when you produce and direct and create and crowdfund and all these things to make a documentary um, have this incredible outcome. What do you hope that audiences take away from it, especially women? I think oh, yeah. you mentioned your own journey about learning this history that's certainly not told to the degree that, you know, I think I maybe had one history unit where they mentioned suffrage and that was it. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Well, that, that's one point I wanted to make is, because, like, we grew up not learning this. Yeah. I mean, at least I didn't. Um, I think if you're a women's history major in college, you learn it, but other than that, you probably don't. Um, so I felt compelled to tell a very comprehensive story. Like, I easily, it wouldn't have been easy, but I, I could have made it a shorter piece, right? I could have just done it on 1917 and the Night of Terror, but I felt it was very important to tell the events leading up to uh, what happened, and then also that we're not equal yet. So um, that's very important for me. A big takeaway is obviously we're, we're not equal. We have a lot of work left to do. Please vote. Don't take it for granted. Um, we need to get it into history books. Um, I feel like it's a very small percentage of women's history that is actually in books. I think it's 5%. Mm -hmm. I know there's an association in California that's working on that, trying to get more of women's history into books. Um, and another thing is these women, they mobilize through like word of mouth. And I mean, you saw the film, protests, parades, newspapers, and we can do so much more and also, like, we shouldn't give up. Like, I know right now it's a very discouraging time with Roe v. Wade being overturned. In fact, I had to edit the film mm -hmm. over the summer um, to add that in. And um, Alice Paul would be turning over in her grave right now with that. And also the Equal Rights Amendment has never been passed. Many people don't know what the Equal Rights Amendment is, mm -hmm. um, including women themselves. Women are not mentioned in the Constitution. Patty, you know, I know that the league is inspiring young women to join the organization, occurring, uh, encouraging them to vote and things like that. So talk to me about doing that work now, you know, for over 100 years, or, you know, past the remove from Alice Paul and her heyday and things. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, so talk about young people? Inspiring or? young women yeah. to, you know, because it seemed like that was the shot in the arm that the movement the women's suffrage, suffrage movement needed at the turn of the century. Like they needed an Alice Paul to come in there, a rebel rouser that was willing to like set things on fire to get the, the cause. So in terms of ushering young people, young women into your, into the cause of the, the League of Women Voters, I mean, do you find that that injection of energy needs to be part of oh. the framework yeah. of keeping the movement alive? Absolutely. Um, I, I think like with any organization, you know, I think I think a lot of nonprofits struggle with this, but it's it's always building the the, the leadership pipeline. You know, people, um, the next generation to carry on what 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 the previous generation has done. So, um, you know, one of the things that the I, I'll just go the the league was part of a big coalition um, that got a law passed in Massachusetts in 2018 requiring student-led civics projects in grades eight through through 12. Um, and so as part, of, as part of that, we are now involved in working with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to do a, a statewide showcase on those student-led civics projects because all the data shows that when you get young people, in, you know, get people involved young, um, at a young age, civically, that those kind of habits and that kind of um, wanting to be involved and in, in engaged in your community carries them through the rest of their life. So, I, so we are working now um, with, as I said, a, a coalition of organizations to work on, the, on showcasing those student-led civics projects. Um, with the first showcase will be next um, spring. Um, and also there are, I mentioned we have 46 local chapters around the state of Massachusetts and um, a handful of those, we, we're working on getting more, but a handful of those um, have very active high school clubs. So again, getting the students involved when they're in high school, they're pre-registering to vote, you know, when they're 16, 17. Um, and so we're trying, we're working on getting more of our local leagues to adopt, 
you know, sort of ad adopt a high school and, 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 get a, and get a high school club going. So those are some of the ways that we're, um, that we're you know, appealing to the next generation to really make sure that the baton can be passed um, and, and the work can continue. Celia, mm -hmm. so, talk to me about what the Women of Color Coalition is doing to also both utilize and energize young, young women to the cause. So we're looking at, that's an area that we still need to build out for our organization. Um, but what we're looking at is intergenerational leadership. Uh, we have a girls' academy that we're hoping to launch next year, next year which deals with, um, part of it will be around the civic. It's really, um, I'd like, I like to say the truth telling about our history in this country, um, because we think that's important. Um, and the civic engagement is a part of that because our members uh, members start at high school girls of color, so that's some of the things that we're gonna be working on to help inspire the next and to build a pipeline for leadership. Shayla, I'm, I'm picking on you because you're the youngest one here on the panel, but like, you know, what, yes, <laughs> <laughs> what energized you to join this work? You talked a little bit about your background and things like that, but talk to me about being in this work, remaining energized, right? And, and then also sending the elevator down yourself. Yeah, uh, that's actually probably my favorite question to, uh, to answer. So uh, I got involved with this work because I'm from Lawrence, Massachusetts. And so Lawrence is a, it, we, we're, we call ourselves the immigrant city. And I'm so proud to be from there and I, I carry my city everywhere I go. And I remember growing up and no one would talk to me about my body. No one would talk to me about what limits and what opportunities I have with my body. Yeah. The only person who ever taught me anything about my body, talking about boundaries or bodily autonomy, was my mom. Mm. And she's a champion, and she's a fighter, she's a bulldog, Dominican mothers, but she, she was the one to tell me, you know, this is your body, this is everything that you can, everything that happens to your body is your choice, right? That was the first time I heard that. And unfortunately, there were so many young girls in my city that just did not have that conversation. And growing up, it was so hard. There was a lot of sex stigma. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of shame, shame around abortion. So growing up, you know, that was, always, that was always on my back. I went to law school, and I had a wonderful professor, Professor Levi, and she was the one to really push me to look into reproductive justice more critically. Um, I wrote a paper for her, and it was wonderful. And so, you know, I started, um, that's kind of the, my involvement in the reproductive justice movement. Um, in terms of what keeps me energized, um, I actually, so I actually was speaking at Smith College and you know, there was a lot of young college students there, all women, and so they asked me a similar question, um, you know, or how to stay energized. And uh, the thing that keeps me going is understanding that within my work and my own personal activism, everything that I do honors the people that came before me. Mm. And I lift up their names and everything that I do because I personally will never let their work go to vain. Uh, these reproductive justice champions that I learned from through the history books, my own research, because you know it's not taught, unfortunately, um, they're, the, they're the ones that keep me going because all these tactics and, act, tactics and all this lobbying and activism, it's not new. Everything that we're doing is not new. You know, these, all these things are, are things that we're learning from our ancestors, the activists that came before us to do this type of work. So when I remember that, I get energized because I realize that I'm honoring them by this work and keeping their legacy moving forward. Um, and that's what I like to tell people. I have lots of conversations with young folks uh, about this movement and, you know, uh, unfortunately after the Dobbs decision, um, you know, there was a lot of fear. Mm. But at the same time, there was so much energy and fire for this movement coming from people that you would never expect. Um, that really is one of the things that keeps me going and that's what I point to, to other people. I'll be like, look around. Look at all the people who are interested in these things today. I mean, look at everybody in the audience who's interested in learning about the suffrage movement. Um, that's really what I point to to other people, and that's what keeps me going. Talking to folks about organizing, does it feel like that needs to happen so that so that 
one, at least somebody can get to the goal. And I think about this, the suffrage movement and how t a lot of other things like we had to put the civil rights uh, conversation on the table. Um, you know, black men, that conversation about their ability to be able to vote had to be put on the table while we talk about suffrage. And so is it that that's by design, by the folks who are trying to suppress those folks, or is it just what happens in, in the nation's attention span? I'm thoughtful, it's your opinion, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm thoughtful about this because you all sort of work in that, in that space. I'll just go yeah. first quickly because I see that you want to say something as well. Um, I know, like, when the Civil War happened, yeah. which is crazy, like, the suffrage movement started before there was even a light bulb. The light bulb was created. So, you know, at first, many of the suffragists, when they started the women's movement, they didn't settle on voting right away. Many of them were abolitionists mm -hmm. and uh, wanted to end slavery. So when the Civil War was happening, many of the suffragists were apprehensive about putting it on hold because mm -hmm. they were very afraid that they would lose momentum. And some of them went and even spoke to Abraham Lincoln and they said, look, we don't want to lose, like I said, the momentum that they have. And he's like, I'll make you a deal. If you stop for a few years, I will advocate for you to get the right to vote. Mm -hmm. And so they put it on hold. And then when the Civil War ended, he was assassinated like a few days later. And so they lost momentum. And so then in 1917, they thought back to that and they said, we're not stopping. We're not stopping again. Um, but that being said, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, like, obviously Wilson was very just um, focused on, on the war. Mm -hmm. And the politicians didn't want to hear anything about suffrage. Um, so I think it's very hard to get anything done in Washington, obviously, we all know that. Um, so possibly, they can only focus on one thing. I don't know. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great help in history, absolutely. Crystal, as a reporter, I was hoping you wouldn't be able to answer that question for us in terms of the news cycle, you know? Yeah. It, it, well, I would say um, the attention, the, the excuse is the attention span. And often, the excuse is the education level of your audience. We are taught in J school, in journalism school, that's the shorthand we use, in journalism school that the average audience has a sixth grade education. And, um, and so you, that's, that's the denominator that you're working toward. And so if someone has a sixth grade education, ask them to talk about reproductive rights and, uh, you know, uh, police violence at the same time, what implicit bias is, you know. I, I remember introducing the term Latinx into my newsroom and it was a, a hardship. Um, and so it was a lot. Um, and yeah, it was a lot. And so I think, it, it's so when I think about, it seems like it's like one, one, one cause at a time, even though people are working in you know their spaces to where that cause continues, we just don't necessarily hear or know about it, and so that's what I, why I asked that question about if there is a feeling, sense, recognition, understanding of that happening within the organizing space outside of how the media covers it, and so that's why I was thoughtful about that when you know it was like people were like okay this is cute y'all want to get the vote but we're in the war so it doesn't matter put that away go home to your kids like yeah. you know buy war bonds you know <laughs> yeah for me think? yeah i just wanted to say that i think if anything that history has taught us is that we can't be silent yeah and that we we need to organize along all along the way um and i mean this is what happened with with the this decision with the role you know, these folks organize, that's another history lesson there, in terms of the organization that was happening behind the scenes all along. So I think that this country is huge. We have so many tools and resources at our disposal. I think is, it is absolutely, um, unfortunately, the more privileged get to really speak and say what the agenda is, if we allow that to continue to happen. And we can. I think there's just, there's no, at least for me, there's just, just no more patience in terms of, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do um, and that it's just, um, it's putting the pressure on as we saw, right? So it's this 
going in front, standing in front of the White House all the time. But, you know, really being strategic about um, the fact that you still need to organize along the way and have several different sort of strategies and approaches and also build your coalition. I mean, this is also part of it. Um, you know, we all can't do this work alone and um, that's where we have partners. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think in terms of all the different issues coming together and picking one, uh, Dr. Kimberly Kentraw gives us a, the term intersectionality and the only way that we're able to get the work done in the way that works for all people is to be intersectional with these causes. You brought up um, you know, the, the Ferguson protest. The Black Lives Matter movement was a movement, is a movement that uh, advocated for um, ending of police violence for black people. That's bodily autonomy. It's having the bodily autonomy to be safe in your communities, right? So when we think, so we use Sister Song's definition of reproductive justice, which is the right to bodily autonomy to have or to not have children and to raise those children in safe communities. That encompasses so much and it ha you have to intersect race, you have to intersect uh, immigration, legal status, economics. I remember I, re I saw an interview of somebody saying, you know, let's, let's put down the abortion thing and let's focus on the economy. Mm. I think every person in here who has the ability to get pregnant has always thought that getting pregnant is an economic uh, uh, idea. Yeah. And how many people, women, have thought I don't know if I'm gonna have kids yet, I have to put my career you know, first, I'm gonna to go to school. Those are economic issues, right? So at its core, abortion encompass, encompasses all these things. So it's not a, well, this has to go first and then maybe this can come second. They're all encompassed on each other. Abortion is a racial issue, economic issue, immigrant issue. Um, and all these things come together in terms of bodily autonomy and the decision and the right to make your own choices. That's all what it's all about, right? So I think it's very hard to just keep going. As we go into the midterms and we think about, I, and I'm also think thoughtful about as you were speaking, like there's always an excuse not to bring up the ERA, right? Like there's always an excuse not to bring it up. Like it's an economy. It's whatever complex, it's the Iraq war, it's the recession, it's the war on drugs, like that was a big, you know, and so I think about that as well in thinking about it being, every issue being an intersectional issue. And, uh, and frankly, the media reporting it that way, right? I think that people are smarter than we give them credit for. Um, and because I, I also think about as we ramp up to election cycles, we want everyone to be experts in, you know, tax law, when we, when we vote and like we send out these booklets, but imagine if we did that for every issue all the time, quarterly. Um, sorry, I digress, but, <laughs> but both, you know, um, this is why these conversations are so important and why good filmmaking is so important because it creates these spaces for, for conversations. I wanna give folks time to ask questions, but I wanna ask um, the, the audience, um, but I want to ask a, a, a question maybe, maybe too. Um, where do we go from here? You all are working actively toward specific goals. The midterm election um, is coming up. I, do you see election cycles as that ramp up? Like Alice Paul was like, do or die, we have to get this passed before the 2020 election. Is that the way you all work in your spaces as organizers? Like every presidential or every midterm is do or die. Or like, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, so our, the League of Women Voters is, is a nonpartisan organization. So we, we want everyone who's eligible to be in the electorate, right? Mm -hmm. So we want, we want as many people who are eligible to vote to actually vote. Um, so I think we don't necessarily think about it um, in terms of, I mean, obviously, you know, issues, there are, there are a lot of things at stake on each election, and, and including the one that's coming up. Um, but I think the more that our mission is to empower voters and defend democracy, so we, we work hard to inform voters as to what is at stake, what is on your ballot, so that people know 
um, you know, are motivated to vote. So I think I think voter education um, is is really part of our core mission. We do that through you know posting candidate forms and Celia and I teamed up this past uh, 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 cycle to do that. And, and more and more, the strategy of candidates is to decline our invitation to get on the stage with their opponent and talk about the issues. So that's a problem. Um, but we're, you know, we're sort of trying to work around that. But um, I think I think voter education is really important. And again, um, you know, representation is important. So if you don't think that your vote matters or that your voice counts, I mean, we're saying, you know, your vote is your your, your voice is your vote. Um, and don't leave that power at home. Take it with you. Go to the ballot box and use your power. So yeah. that that's where that's what I would say about that. Yeah, because I think of the contentiousness. The reason why I asked that question. The contentiousness of the last four years, of a lot of people have just opted out of voting. And I think of watching this film, it reminds us of how how hard we fought for those, for that. Yeah. But people going, this is a mess and I'm staying away from it. And having that be more powerful right. to keep them away from right. the ballot box. So I'm and thoughtful about that challenge when you're getting motivated. Right, and, and part of our jobs, as Patty's talking about, is mm -hmm. that we, have, we are actively thinking about different ways and how we can make things interesting so that we can get people back in. And part of that strategy is, you know, the education. We find that um, we've seen, as we have done this work together, that there are increases in people getting out there. And so that is encouraging. Um, and then we're even looking at, we are looking at this all year round, right? Mm -hmm. This is not just a, a, a cycle thing. It's like all year round, this work is important to continue to build upon the grounds that we're making. Um, and so, you know, part of that um, strategy uh, in terms of what we're doing as well is not only leading up to the vote, but also how do we help our, our residents to understand their power even after they vote in regards to elected officials? Because we have the right to hold them accountable. So we're even thinking about how do we put some programming together to demystify, you know, the, the, the fact that now you voted, now how do you go and then, you know, engage with your public official so that your concerns in your local communities or statewide are being addressed and to be able to help with um, promoting and in inspiring and empowering. Um, because I firmly believe once you know more, right, you do, you do more. Um, and so that's a constant, you know, strategy that we're always thinking about how do we continue to look at this differently and learn from what we've done to be able to do better as well, improve from a continuous improvement lens. And I hear you about intersectionality. Race and gender for us are always about, you know, what we see every, what we have to deal with every day. So, anyways, I just wanted to comment on that. For sure. I appreciate that. Um, in terms of voting, you know, exactly, exactly what uh, my fellow pan panelists are saying, it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing process, right? Definitely during election time, we're at the the hottest points. You know, trying to get out the vote, encourage you know our those running for office. You know, get get people their stances on abortion. You know, make sure we're electing the right people who have the strongest stances on our rights. Um, but then an off season or off election season, that's when the education starts. That's when we're talking about you know why does abortion matter? Why is it on the ballot? You know, how is it on the ballot? Because you know, we live in a democratic republic. We are voting people to vote for our rights. Mm -hmm. So abortion is always gonna be on the ballot by way of the people we vote for. Um, but then we have very special times where abortion quite literally is on the ballot. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite story uh, since the Dobbs decision came out was uh, Kansas. Kansas had uh, an amendment, right, to be voted on that in the amendment it said uh, abortion is not going to be a state constitutionally protected uh, item, right? And this, the folks of Kansas, the residents of Kansas, Kansas were able to, to vote on this amendment to, to say Kansas, is, there's no abortion right, uh, constitutionally protected abortion right in the state of Kansas. And with 59% of the vote coming back, they voted down that amendment and said that Kansas has an abortion right uh, based on that state constitution. Mm -hmm. Abortion is a winning issue. Abortion <laughs> is a winning issue, you know? And so, and so that's where the work 
happens. Well, we get excited about abortion. You know, I, I get excited about abortion. I love talking about <laughs> abortion. So that's, that's where the work happens all throughout the year, uh, whether we're election season or not. Get people fired up, and once there's a special candidate that we're particularly fired up about that is the most champion of abortion rights that we want to get out there, or uh, like Ayanna Presley, or one of the biggest champions of abortion that we're so lucky to have, um, or when abortion's quite literally on the ballot, you know, that's how we get people excited. Yeah. So the question was, if you guys didn't hear, how, how do the panelists within their work combat misinformation about their particular organization's um, missions? Yeah. I mean, I go back to truth telling, really. Yeah. I mean, because, and I know, you know, Sometimes it's the 30 seconds bite, right, that people sort of run with. Um, but it, and it is a challenge. I'm not, I mean, it's a wonderful question. We are living, we are living in a world right now where people are literally running with not the facts. <laughs> and so we're constantly having to really think about this and also be brief <laughs> because of social media and everything else. But we go back, right back to the facts about you know, sort of the history about voting, what's happening, and really, we those rights are being deteriorated. I mean, and so it's we're really not safe here. I mean, people really need to know that, especially with the Voting Rights Act, which was one of the sweeping legislation that eliminated discrimination in voting, as now there's been a, a ruling in a section of it that has states now um, decreasing access to vote. So, and again, it's right there. We can show you what's happening and why this is important. Um, and even now, there's still a pending case I think that you were just gonna speak briefly about. So for us, it's going back, it's having those conversations. There are also relationships. You have to think about you know, relationships and um, you know, different people in the community that are trusted leaders. So we're going at this in all different <laughs> angles to be able to uh, let people really know what the truth is and what's truly what is it that we're fighting for in terms of our democracy. Yeah, and I mean, for the League of Women Voters, I mean, we've always been a nonpartisan organization, meaning we don't endorse candidates and we don't endorse parties, but we do take um, positions on issues ba uh, you know, based on a really lengthy study um, and member consensus. So um, I think nowadays, as Silly was saying, everything is deemed you know, political or partisan. So because you are because we have a stand, for example, on, uh, just an example, um, we helped pass the um, law in Massachusetts in June to allow undocumented immigrants to have a driver's license, and that was summarily <laughs> put to a citizen's initiative uh, petition and got enough, so now it's on the ballot to repeal the law. Um, that is not, I mean, that's an issue that we have had a position on for many, many years, um, and, you know, it's not, it's not a partisan issue. Yeah, so it, there is a lot of education. I think there's just to your point, there's a lot of education that needs to be done about what is you know what is partisan and, and what is nonpartisanship. So we're constantly trying to you know um, explain what that that we're not endorsing candidates, we're not endorsing parties, just because these days the Republican Party is anti-immigration across the board. I think that people equate that with the league taking a partisan you know position. And, and as Silly was saying, I just want to say that, I mean, for the first time in 50 years, you know, the Supreme Court is taking away rights. So with the Dobbs decision, um, the gutting of, the, of parts of the Voting Rights Act, um, and I'm just going to mention, I'm not going to go into this case, but um, there's a case before the Supreme Court, um, Harper, Moore v. Harper, um, and the, the Supreme Court will be deciding whether or not the North Carolina Supreme Court had the power to strike down a, uh, an egregious ger gerrymandering um, map that the, the state legislature in North Carolina um, drew. And basically, there were the legislators um, in North Carolina are relying on this debunked uh, theory, the independent state legislature theory, that basically says that the state legislature and, and no other state entity, not the state courts, not the governor, should be the final arbiter of, of, um, of, of uh, interpreting the, the U.S. Constitution's election clause. So basically, it, this, is, this would allow state legislatures to um, unchecked, no checks and balances, would allow them 
um, to have to do, do gerrymandering, not just on partisan lines, but racial lines and anything else. So this is, I, I'm not going to, I'm not, I can't do this justice. So if you want more information, go on to the Vernon Center for Justice website. Um, Moore v. Harper is the name of the case. But this is a very, this is, I don't want to end on a bad note, but this is a very scary, this is a very scary proposition. Um, the, the case will be argued on December 7th and the, the, the opinion will be out sometime in the spring. So, um, the other side is organizing and <laughs> yeah. doing and, their and work. Like well, we're trying movie. to activate people, and right? Like this so, movie, right? Yeah. The importance of this movie in this moment about the sacrifices, you know, that these women um, certainly did, and also other people of color who have sacrificed in this country so that we can vote. And so, hopefully, that this is inspiring us to get out and vote uh, on November eighth, and that we continue to really learn. Uh, because as we know, we haven't really learned all of the true history in our country. Mm -hmm. And so when things come up, I would ca say my call to action would be, please find out the truth before you make that final decision. Mm -hmm. And vote. <laughs>
Uh, Jacqueline, do you have another film that you're working on now? Oh, gosh, I love this question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am working on one. Of course, we're going to do one. Um, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm doing one that's a little off topic. It's not focused on women. Um, I'm doing one on something called digital nomads. Mm. It's people who work remote and travel around the world. Um, maybe I will have a women focus in there, I'm not quite sure, but I, I myself am also a part-time digital nomad, so I get to work remote, and I've traveled Europe for a few months, Canary Islands, so I've been able to like interview people, um, I've interviewed about three people, but it's a, it's a big trend happening now um, because of COVID. A lot of people have remote jobs, and they're like, why am I going to stay home? I can travel the world, so it's, it's a whole new trend. So. Well, we wish you well thank you. Uh, with this film, as well as your future endeavors. Okay. And ladies, thank you all <laughs> for joining us this evening. Please listen to what they're saying. You know, let's just continue to educate our communities, our friends and family, not to argue, but to really inform people with the truth. Let's hope that the truth wins and go to the polls to vote. Thank yes. you all, and join us at the festival passes uh, for the after party right across the street. Thank you again.